Are you always on the lookout for the new big tip or trick for when it comes to caring for your houseplants? Whether it's pests or dealing with propagations, stick with me and I'll show you some of my slightly weird and off kilter tips and tricks that I do to keep my houseplant collection happy. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So I want to dive into something a little bit different today. I know a lot of my viewers will watch my videos because they'll get little tips and tricks that I do just by kind of talking about my collection and all these things and they can then see what I do and maybe kind of say, oh, I do that as well, or maybe I should try that as well. So I thought I'd give you a more of a specific video of some of the weird and unusual things that I've done in my collection to deal with different things that have worked for me. Now, as I've said before, I am not a botanist. I do have some scientific background. None of this is based in scientific background, some of it loosely, but pre predominantly not. But these are things that have worked for me. Again, if you have any of your own tips, let me know down below in the comments. And yeah, the more we share, the more we can all learn essentially. And stick around until the very end. I've got a very cool kind of tip and trick that I've kind of learned from and adjusted to be my own, if that makes sense, from Lisa, the happy plant collector on Instagram. And I'll kind of link Lisa up at the top there as well. But yes, without further ado, let's dive into some of these. Okay, and I think the first one, I don't know whether or not, no, there's another one as well that's about pests, but the first one that I want to talk about is something that I think a lot of us really got into using as far as I could tell, basically, and it is this stuff. So you might recognize it if you've ever used it before, but essentially what this is, is the Velcro plant ties. And originally, I think these were sold for kind of outdoor gardening and predominantly to tie things up that are a bit more fragile in terms of their stems, like tomatoes and stuff like that. So if you ever buy one of these potentially from Amazon, you'll see that usually it's got uh, an image of a tomato plant. And these are really great. I mean, part of the reason why they became as popular is because A, they're reusable, but B, there are a lot more gentle when it comes to kind of tying up certain plants. The other option, which a lot of people might have been using previously, is something like um, the wire coated in plastic type of plant ties. I know a lot of people potentially use something like twine or some form of string as well, but a lot of us did gravitate towards this. And to be fair, I've still using it sparingly in my collection. And my first tip and something that I've learned over the years now actually is that I need to be very careful on where I use these Velcro plant ties. And I'll elaborate a bit on that. Now, what I've kind of noticed a lot of the times, especially again for the people that have been here for a while, <laughs> mealybugs, um, this is a problem when it comes to mealybugs. I've noticed this time and time and time again, basically. And the, the most obvious example I can give on this is on something like a Hoya. And you might kind of see where I'm going with this. And you might also notice that this kind of heirloom Hoya essentially isn't really attached on anything. And when, it will, when I will attach it to the little support stick, I will do this with the metal, the plastic coated metal wire basically. And it's only because I don't have string, otherwise I would use string. But there is a good reason for this. So if I was to use this, and when I have used this in the past and I had so many of my Hoyas with this being the thing that was holding it up because I'm just sitting there going, oh my God, look at the stem. It's so thin, it could be delicate. These leaves can get really heavy and it can snap off. So for a long period of time, I was using the plastic coated kind of wire. And eventually, because I thought I was being a good plant parent, I moved over to this. Now, <laughs> and I've been transitioning all of my Hoyas off of this Velcro now and onto these again. Problem is, the problem exists now. And what is that? This 
when it's wrapped around the stem, I'm not even gonna attempt to do it with this one at the moment, it then creates, so a couple of things. First, I think people were getting this because they're sitting there going, you know what, it can, if a plant's stem gets a bit thicker, it can rip through the Velcro better than it would the metal twine. Yes and no, depending on how you've wound the, the Velcro around, if you've only gone once and a bit, that should be fine. It will kind of snap off and open up when it needs to. But if you've gone down around a couple of times, that stuff ain't moving. You're still gonna get that dent in the stem and you're still gonna get some of that kind of collaring and restriction that's gonna happen there. The big problem though, however, with the mealybugs, it creates an area, so if you'd imagine, let me just bring this up again, I don't know why I keep putting it down. So, if I get this to focus, so if you can imagine the area between the plant and the actual Velcro itself is the perfect breeding ground for mealybugs to hide in the hundreds, basically. Sometimes I've opened up some of that Velcro and I'm just, I've been dealing with mealybugs on this for so long and I keep getting rid of them and how are they coming back? And I took some of the Velcro off and you literally could not see the white back of the Velcro for the white fluffy mealybugs that were just living their best life in there. So the biggest tip I can give you at this particular moment in time Use the Velcro very sparingly and check on it. It's something we don't ever do and something that I don't think I've ever seen anybody talk about. Check behind your Velcro to plant times. <laughs> One more thing we all need to do. <laughs> um, to see if you've got issues with needy bugs. This is especially important, I think, if you already have a mealybug infestation or if you've got mealybugs that you do, just don't seem to be able to shift and you've got some of this, Stop whatever it is you're doing and go and check on this because a lot of the mealybugs might be hiding between the Velcro plant tie and your plant. And it basically means that they're just gonna keep bringing out new babies that will st still keep infesting the rest of the plant. But that area where that Velcro is attaching is probably getting sapped dry by a lot of these mealybugs. So my big tip is Use it, but using sparingly, and potentially go back to the good old trusty plastic tied, plastic covered metal ties, basically, or twine. And I know there's his own issues with this. I do get it, but ironically enough, at least in my experience, this gave me so much less trouble than this has. The next one might seem a bit obvious, but it is. So I'm showing you the Soil Ninja Anthurium bag here, basically. This is their Anthurium soil mix. And essentially, the point I'm trying to make here is use soil mixes that might be specific to something like Anthurium, and <laughs> please don't sell this out because this has been a godsend at the moment. I mean, please do, because the, the guys at Soil Ninja are lovely people, but please, please, please make sure that this is restocked because I desperately love and need this at the moment. And the point I'm trying to make is, just because something says Anthurium, and I think this one is also Anthurium and orchids, basically. Just because it says that it's for one type of plant doesn't mean you can't use it for other types of plants. And I'll give you a reason why. So this ticks a lot of the boxes and it's very good and it's very well created for Anthuriums because it has an awful lot of aeration. It's got the bark, it's got the perlite, it's got the zeolite, it's got loads of air pockets inside of it, but it also means that this does and can dry out a bit faster than some of the other mixes, potentially something like an alocasia, potentially something like a mix that might be used for Monstera or even Hoya. Now, why am I saying use other soil mixes other than what they're intended for? This is specifically for all of us overwaterers out there. <laughs> because, and I don't know how much more bluntly I can put this. Some of these instructions are not meant for us. They're not meant for us. They're not meant for us. You know, like the plants that you're sitting there going, they need to be evenly moist and they need to be like always getting water and you're using the right soil mix for them. Guess what you're probably still doing? You're probably still drowning those plants, regardless of whether or not you're using the regular soil mix that is meant for those plants. So for example, an alocasia. And you're using the alocasia soil mix 
and then you're still overwatering, and it's just like, why, am I, why, why is this rotting out? And why am I having all these issues? Because you're still overwatering. You're using the right soil mix, but you, the problem isn't the soil mix. The problem is us. <laughs> We overwater. That's not going to change. So using something like this, if you are an overwaterer, will give you that extra little bit of cushion. Yes, it might mean that you need to water a bit more frequently, and I know that's a bit of a pain in the summer. <laughs> I feel you. But it's a safer bet. And I have said this, and everybody else on YouTube and Instagram has said this as well, it's generally better to have underwatered than to have overwatered. So this is a good one. And, it, and this flips both ways, by the way. So if you see a soil mix that is meant to be more moisture retaining for plants that are meant to kind of want a bit more moisture in their roots, so something like a fern potentially, if you are a chronic underwaterer, guess what I'm gonna say here, is as long as there's some aeration in it, as long as there's some form of perlite or bark or, or anything else that will kind of break up that soil so it's not dense, Use that. Use that for, for the exact same reason that the overwaterer should be using something as airy as an anterior mix. Now, how does this work if you're doing your own soil mixes? Because I know a lot of people aren't going to sit there and buy ready-made soil mixes. I hear you. What I would say for you is if you are doing a soil mix and you're sitting there going, you know what, I am going to, and if you're an overwaterer, and I'm gonna add, because I've seen everybody else and a good aroid mix, I'm gonna add like this much perlite and this much like bark or anything like that that's gonna give it aeration. I would say stop and use twice how much you think you wanna be using. Hmm? And flip side of that, if you're an overwaterer, stop and use half of what you think you're gonna be needing basically on there. You still need that aeration, but if you're not gonna water that regularly, if you're one of these people that will water your plants like once a month or once every two months, you wanna keep some of that moisture there as much as possible. You still need that aeration so it doesn't rot out, so it doesn't stay sapping wet for the two months that you've got it there. But the tip still stands, you don't always have to use an anthurium soil mix, for example, on just anthuriums. I have used this on a lot of my plants now. Some philodendrons, some monstera, some of my ferns as well. They are loving life. Calatheas, my calatheas love this. So all I'm saying is, and again, because of the care that I give them, experiment, use different soil mixes. I know some of us will do this because we're lazy inherently and just go, I haven't done any other soil mix, so I'm just gonna use this and some of the other things. Then you discover, you're just like, oh my, like this is the good stuff. So yeah, use different soil mixes for what they're intended, basically. The next big tip that I've got for you is using something like the Humble Rooting Powder. And I'm not specifically talking about the gel here. I am talking, mm, the gel probably could actually, to be fair but the rooting powders, which is the ones that most people can find more easily, they're relatively cheap and affordable, but again, not entirely for their intended purpose. Bear with me with this one, it will all make sense. Now, yes, you will always get the benefit of a rooting powder if you put it on a fresh cut plant, basically. So let me see, I've got one here that's rooting out in water. Has it rooted out? No, it's done something. But say for instance, this Chia Pence, which I do need to try just putting it straight into soil. I think everybody else has kind of said anything but just water with these things will do better. But say I didn't have any of these aerial roots and I just made the cut there on this plant and I just had a fresh cutting. And everybody's always like, you know what? You need to let that end bit callus over. I'm always a proponent of just letting it sit in the air for like a few hours, maybe a day, maybe 24 hours. There, trust me, there's enough moisture in the stem and in the leaves to sustain the plant whilst it just calluses over. However, I also know that people are in a hurry. And there's a lot of people that have been doing certain things when it comes to being more kind of at home ways of callusing over that cut a lot faster. And essentially what you're trying to do is make sure that no moisture goes in so that you don't get any kind of pathogens or anything like that going in through the cut or even, even encouraging kind of rot really. 
And people have used cinnamon, people have used, I think, diatomaceous earth, some people have used honey. Um, I think I've seen some people also use charcoal. All of these things, and I know there's a lot of people that get pressed about these kind of methods and techniques, and they're just like, no, 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 and it will call these things. But I'm just like, if it's worked for you, don't listen to the rest of us. If it has always worked for you, don't listen to the rest of us. It's as simple as that, basically. At the end of the day, if it works for you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you want to maybe attempt something else, a lot of the rooting powder, yes, it will have small amounts. It's not huge amounts, trust me, because if you do try to find very concentrated versions of rooting powders and kind of growth hormones for plants, you can, and if you do a bit of Google research, you can find what they are. They're used a lot of the times for tissue culturing house plants because that's the hormones that's needed. This usually, most of the rooting powders have got some variation of rooting hormones, but not necessarily in huge volumes. But a lot of the rooting powders one of their predominant thing that they're there for, basically, because keep in mind, this, a lot of the times, rooting powders are not necessarily meant exclusively for houseplants. They are meant for the garden. Now, think about the garden. If you're gonna take a cutting from a plant and you wanna shove it into some soil because you basically want it to root out, you are not most average gardeners. They're not gonna sit there and go, I'm gonna let this callus over for like a couple of days and see how it goes. And I'm gonna baby this plant. They don't, they just, they wanna take the cutting, they wanna shove it into the soil straight away. So part of what the rooting powders have had to do over the years, other than the fact that they've got rooting hormone in them, they have got, as far as I understand, some either antiviral, antibacterial kind of properties, which would basically at least seal that cut. It won't be like it's just been calloused over, especially if you're gonna put it straight into something that's wet, but it will help to inhibit a lot of things from growing. It doesn't stop them entirely and it's not a foolproof guarantee, but if you are in a hurry and you've just taken a cutting and you just wanna put it into something to root out, yes, the, the, the point of a rooting hormone is to kind of promote those roots, but say for instance, you've got your aerial roots, which is where you think the plant is gonna root from, but it's higher than where you've made the cut. This is still a relatively viable option to use. And again, this has worked in my experience. If you've had differing experiences, that is fine. But this is, this is kind of essentially what has worked for me. And I still use it quite frequently and it does a really good job. And obviously I'm still adding rooting hormones. So <laughs> double whammy here. Now the next thing is about artificial lighting. And I've got a packet here, which I haven't used yet, but I will show you and hopefully it will make a bit of sense uh, if I hide myself there. So essentially this is a spool of LED lighting strips. And a lot of the times you'll get this for under the kitchen counter and all these things. This is stuff that you'll get in DIY stores a lot of the time. I tend to get mine from Amazon just because it's easier and I can get the longer kind of stretches of this that I need. But a lot of the times, if you don't want to, or you've got really kind of awkward places, or you've got shorter shelves, this is predominantly when you've got short shelves, basically. So something like this might be a bit too tall, but say for instance, I've got a shelf that's maybe, I'm trying to see some of my shortest shelves that I've got this on. Mm. So maybe about 30 centimeters, 35, 40, about there basically, and I'll hopefully put the translation for the people that don't do metric basically. That kind of distance could work quite well because you need to remember if a shelf is this big, you're probably gonna have a pot. So the plant is gonna be even closer to that lighting source. Now, the issue that a lot of people would have with something like LED strips is they're just like, oh, it's not bright enough. However, the thing that I would say with some of these strips is go for the brightest one that you can buy. And a lot of the times they'll have lumens or they'll have anything like that that you can buy. It's interesting because I used to buy the cold colored ones. So the ones, the white that leans towards blue. I'm not sure, these are not grow lights. So they don't, you don't get that purple light basically. These are just regular kind of white LED strips basically. I would always go for the colder light. And I think I saw a couple of the growers and sellers here in the UK that not necessarily talk about LED lights, but they were talking about kind of just using regular light, like light bulbs, 
for growing their plants and they've had great success. And they were actually saying that the warm light light bulbs tend to do better than the cool light light bulbs. So I haven't tried this. This is unfortunately, I'd already bought this before I kind of realized that, but I will be testing that out and seeing if there's a difference. But even with the cool light one, I've had some good success. Now, the other thing that I would say, if you're gonna be buying something like that, you can get them a lot of the time where you'll get something like this attached or within the same packaging as the actual grow lights. And what this is, is a dimmer. Now, the reason why this is quite a good thing is when your plants, say you've got that shelf that I was talking about and your plants are getting really, really close to the top and where you've put the LED strip to get some extra supplemental lighting there, they're getting quite close and it might be a bit too much light for them. This is especially true if all of your plants are kind of growing roughly at the same rate. So they're all about the same height, basically. You can turn down the dimmer. It's as simple as that, rather than having to move things around, because the issue that you will potentially get with this is when you attach it, it's attached, basically. A lot of the times these come with like tape on the back of them, so you can just stick them there. And in my humblest of opinions, this might be a bit more faff to set up when you've got shelves, but this, in my humble opinion, looks a lot better in most spaces rather than just having a random light bulb. Even what well, It doesn't matter what you put onto them. Grow lights are not sexy. This isn't particularly sexy, but this is, at least in my eyes, slightly less offensive, basically. And it's worked like a charm. It's the thing that I've been using for years, and it's worked really well. Do I have proper grow lights as well? Yes. Do I see a bit of a difference? Yes. The proper grow lights, I might get slightly faster growth rate, but this still does me so proud, because some of these kind of LED strips I have got in my darkest of shelves, again, smaller shelves I'm talking about, works like a charm. Otherwise I wouldn't still be using it nearly four years later basically. It does really, really well, especially, and I will give you this as a free little tip, if you've got anthurium seedlings. Because anthurium seedlings, they need light. You need to have it on for X amount of time. I'm not gonna go into that kind of detail, but they don't need too much bright light. And unless you've paid a lot of money for a very expensive grow light that has got a dimmer on it, this will do you proud because this, even at the brightest level, even with the dimmer, even in a very long length, is still a lot of the times, at least here in the UK, a heck of a lot cheaper than buying a very standard basic grow light bulb. And you've got a bulb, then you need to get a fixing for it. It adds up relatively quickly. For me, this, is, this was a no-brainer and it still is a no-brainer. And coming into my final little tip that I said, which is the one that I kind of saw from Lisa for the first time ever, basically, and I've kind of adjusted it. So this might seem really odd, but, and I thought, you know what, I, I didn't have anything to lose because these things don't cost that much money. So what this is, and it, mine looks a bit manky, but I do, it did come in a pack of like five or 10. So what this is, is a brush, I bought this on Amazon. I think this is meant to be for like people that do art. Um, and this part of it is just a clear container that you're meant to use colors or dyes or anything like that. And then it just kind of twists back on and it twists the wrong way around, if that makes sense. Um, and you can use this brush for kind of art projects. Mine is slightly leaky at the moment, but. So the way that Lisa was originally using it, and I have found that it's worked quite well, and I think I did a video about kind of like trying to get leaves unstuck on philodendrons. I am looking at you, pink princess. But what she would do with this is say there was, let me, let me use my finger. Say there was a caterpill here and it was stuck. What she would do, and this is why these types of brushes that are very, very thin, are quite good and thin and flat. She would go in between the leaf and the caterpill. She would fill this up with just plain water and make sure that this is damp, the brush part of it is damp. And then she would go in between very gently and see if she can get it unstuck without forcing the leaf out necessarily, but seeing if she can get some moisture in there. Yes, I know there's risks with this. Yes, I know that this could encourage other things, but actually her little tip worked like a charm. I don't know if it's her tip, but I, I saw it for the first time from her, so I'm giving her credit for this. What I have done, however, with this, <laughs> it's a double whammy, and it's the thing that has been working for the people that have been here for a while that know that I've been dealing with mealybugs for a very long period of time. This has worked a charm. This is rubbing alcohol. 
What is in this is not water at the moment, it is rubbing alcohol. <laughs> Three guesses what I'm using this for really well, actually. This I'm using, so the, the kind of the usual advice when it comes to dealing with mealybugs is you use rubbing alcohol and you get a little Q-tip and you sit there and you just basically try to pick every single one of these up. <laughs> I know it's a thing that you don't necessarily have to buy, but actually when you've got quite a few mealybugs, this is, this is really useful basically, because I'd be just wasting too many Q-tips and it's, it's slightly more sustainable. I mean, it's plastic still, but... but this has worked a charm, and the, I, the, the big brush as well has worked really well. I still need to spray, I find, rather than just relying on the alcohol from here. I still need to spray, but then when I've sprayed, it's a lot easier for me to go up over the entire leaf and just, and it picks up, and you will get, and this is why there's so much discoloration on this brush, and it used to be like brilliantly white. There's a whole bunch of dead, mealy bugs in there. And yes, I will kind of then, after I've kind of dealt with all the mealy bugs, go into maybe something like water and kind of brush it out and make sure. And I know there's gonna be some people saying, you know what, there's probably some mealy bug eggs or larva that's stuck in there. Yeah, but guess what? That's got rubbing alcohol in it. Good luck to them is all I'm gonna say basically, because this is something that stays relatively permanently wet. Game changer absolute game changer and it's the randomest of things that you wouldn't normally be doing and yes it still requires you to sit there and like paint on the leaves and see if you can get the like mealy bugs off but like a charm absolutely like a charm whether or not you could use this in a similar way with some of the other kind of solutions that we might all use Possibly. I don't know if this would do quite well with like oily solutions. So if anything with neem oil, I don't know whether or not this would work and you wouldn't necessarily want to be brushing on something like neem oil with this mold of a brush. It'll take a while basically. But absolutely amazing. And it has worked like a charm for me. Do I still use it occasionally to pull out leaves? Stuck leaves? Yes. And actually I'm leaving the alcohol in there as well because at the end of the day, with the alcohol instead of water, it still manages to get it unstuck. You need to be very, 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 very gentle. Um, and there's no water then left because the alcohol will evaporate. But it's enough usually to get that leaf unstuck from the sheath as well. But yes, as I said, cannot take claim for this as the leaf thing because it was a Lisa idea. I can't even take claim because it's still a Lisa idea that I've just slightly edited. Um, but for mealybugs, it works like a charm. Okay, and that is all of my tips for this video. I know probably some of you might want me to do more of these videos and I will, I promise, when I have enough of these kind of weird and kooky tips to show you. These are the predominant ones that I'm using quite a lot these days. But as I said, as I come up with some new weird and unusual things, I will share with you, I try not to gatekeep as much as possible, basically. But as I said in the very beginning, let us all know your weird and unusual things. Do not be shy, shy, do not be shy to share the weird and wonderful things that make you, you, and they make your plant caring, your plant caring, basically. Also, I will say this, for anybody there that wants to be mean, no judging anybody. If it works for them, it works for them. I get it, I get it. We all think we're experts, none of us are experts. We are only experts with our own plants in our own collection. Do not claim this on other people, basically. But yes, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, bye.